குட் ஈவினிங் ஆஸ்பிரண்ட்ஸ் வெல்கம் டு த ஹிந்து நியூஸ் அனாலிசிஸ் பை சங்கர் ஐஎஸ் அகாடமி ஃபார் த டேட் சிக்ஸ்டீன்த் ஆஃப் மே டூ தௌசண்ட் டுவெண்டி டூ தீஸ் ஆர் த லிஸ்ட் ஆஃப் ஆர்டிகல்ஸ் வி வில் பி டிஸ்கசிங் டுடே பிஃபோர் கெட்டிங் இன் டு த நியூஸ் ஆர்டிகல் டிஸ்கஷன் லெட் அஸ் டேக் அப் ஒன் ப்ரீவியஸ் இயர் கொஸ்டின் ஃப்ரம் த டுவெண்ட்டி நைன்டீன் பேப்பர் சி திஸ் கொஸ்டின் இஸ் அபவுட் ஸ்வதேஷி மூமெண்ட் டூ ஸ்டேட்மெண்ட்ஸ் ஆர் கிவன் வி ஹவ் டு ஃபைன் த கரெக்ட் ஸ்டேட்மெண்ட்ஸ் லெட் அஸ் டேக் அப் த ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஸ்டேட்மெண்ட் it contributed to the revival of indigenous artisan crafts and industries see this statement is correct let us take up the second statement the national council of education was established as a part of swadeshi movement see this statement is also correct since both the statements are correct here the correct option is option c 1 and 2 see with this let us also see some of the basic information about swadeshi movement see the movement had its base in the anti partition movement which was started to oppose lord curzon's decision to divide the province of bengal see in august 1905 at calcutta town hall a massive meeting was held and a formal proclamation of swadeshi movement was made so note that in 1905 at calcutta town hall swadeshi movement was proclaimed okay moving on the decision was taken to boycott manchester cloth and liverpool salt although the movement was mostly confined to bengal it spread to few different places of india in pune and bombay it was under bal gangadhar tilak in punjab under lala lajpat rai and ajit singh in delhi it was under said haider raisa and in madras it was under v o chidambaram pillai so note these points there might be a match type question from this okay now moving on see the radical leaders in congress wanted to take the movement beyond bengal and not limit itself to the boycott of foreign cloth salon but congress was under the control of moderate leaders right at that time so they opposed this move krishna kumar mitra in his newspaper sanjeevani highlighted the prospect of national education and economic swadeshi see this movement was supported by bengali middle class and bengali intelligentsia okay and tilak called this movement as the bahishakar yoga and surendranath banerji called this movement as a protectionist movement so note these two points also okay now moving on the schools and college students were the most active participant of the movement student participation was visible in bengal pune andhra pradesh and in tamil nadu it was mainly visible in madras and salem the police adopted a repressive attitude towards the students the students found guilty were fined expelled beaten arrested and disqualified for government jobs and scholarship see in swadeshi and boycott movement women also took active participation even muslims participated however most of the upper and middle class muslims stayed away from the swadeshi and boycott movement the upper class and middle class muslims supported the partition of bengal on the belief that it would provide them a muslim majority east bengal okay see inspired by ramindranath tagore's shanti niketan the bengal national college and a number of national schools and colleges in various parts of the country were set up In August 1906 the National Council of Education was set up to organize the national education system a Bengal Institute of Technology was set up for technical education also there was a growth in swadeshi industries during the movement the movement led to the establishment of swadeshi textile mills soap and match factories tanneries banks insurance companies shops etc the movement also revived the indian cottage industry Indian industries saw regeneration with reawakening of the use of indigenous goods. In addition to this, due to this movement, foreign imports dropped significantly. Okay? So this was about the Swadeshi and boycott movement. What happened in the aftermath is that in 1911, the partition of Bengal was finally annulled by Lord Hardinge. See Lord Hardinge annulled the partition of Bengal mainly to curb the revolutionary terrorism. This annulment was not taken well by Muslims. So consequently the British shifted the administrative capital from Calcutta to Delhi as Delhi was associated with the Muslim glory. Okay? See these are some important facts about Swadeshi movement. With this let us conclude the previous year question discussion session and take up the first article for our discussion. 
take a look at this editorial article this editorial article is written in the backdrop of the recent verdict on the marital rape case this case dealt with constitutionality of the marital rape exception clause in the indian penal code the verdict has been pronounced by the delhi high court but it is a split verdict that is the justices who delivered the judgment had differing opinions and there were two verdicts the verdict declared by judge number 2 did not declare the marital rape exception clauses unconstitutional so author calls to resolve this split verdict and provide us reason as to why the assertion of judge 2 is wrong therefore in this discussion let us understand what is marital rape the clause that is being challenged and what are the split verdicts and the issue with the verdict before getting into the discussion the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here for your reference you can go through it now let us start the discussion see what is marital rape marital rape is a intimate partner violence where rape is committed by the victim's spouse here the perpetrator is victim's spouse and most often the perpetrator is the husband the woman is victimized as the sexual intercourse between married people is not a result of love with consent but rather it is a result of coercion and lacks consent of the wife due to this many are demanding to declare marital rape as rape and fully criminalize it so does that mean our law allow marital rape see actually yes our laws only partially criminalize marital rape to understand how we need to look at the rape section in the indian penal code rape is dealt by the section 375 the section defines rape and state what constitutes rape according to the section rape is a sexual intercourse or sexual penetration when there is a lack of consent you can clearly see here the section provides seven descriptions of when certain acts will be considered rape each of those description deals with consent here consent means an unequivocal voluntary agreement to participate in the specific sexual act unequivocal voluntary would mean communicating the willingness to participate in the specific sexual act by a woman through words or gesture or any form of verbal or non verbal communication so when there is absent of this consent it is considered rape under section 375 of ipc the section is so clear in defining rape that it mentions that even when a woman does not physically resist the act of sexual penetration it will not be considered as consent that means the consent or the willingness to participate in the sexual act should be clearly communicated in the absence of such communication the sexual act will be considered a rape this is why an essential ingredient to prove the crime of rape is to prove the lack of consent so the indian penal code is clear about rape except for one instance it is when the consent is presumed to exist this is the case when the victim and the perpetrator are married this presumption is the result of patriarchy where they argue that sexual intercourse is a conjugal right and exception of the partner so conjugal rights are the rights and privileges in a marriage or among a married couple so it includes the intimate rights of marriage including the companionship affection and sexual relation so the proponents of patriarchy say that the arguments of consent is defeated in front of conjugal exception of the husband particularly this is the reason why in india the idea of marital rape is seen as antithetical to the presumed consent but how does ipc assume this presumed consent the presumed consent exists through the exception clause in section 375 which defines rape the exception is provided to the instances where the consent is not required so i said that the section defines and list what constitutes rape in the same manner it also provides clarification of what will not constitute rape under its exception clause our concern is with the second exception it mentions that sexual intercourse or sexual acts by a man with his own wife is not rape unless the wife is under 15 years of age this means if the wife is not under 15 years of age and is above this age then it will not amount to rape so we can say that 
protection to married females partners exist in IPC, but only to married girl childrens under 15 years of age, which is nothing but a child marriage, which is already punishable under other Indian laws. Also note that the age limit was increased to 18 years by a Supreme Court judgment in 2017 case called the Independent Thought vs Union of India case. See overall we can say that Indian Penal Code disregards or ignores the sexual autonomy and bodily autonomy of all women who are 18 years old and above. Bodily autonomy means that we have the power and agency to make choices over our bodies and futures without violence or coercion. This includes sexual autonomy also, which means the power to decide when to have sex and with whom to have sex or whether to have sex at all. It incorporates the freedom to decide one's sexual relation within wedlock as well as out of wedlock. So, sexual autonomy among women essentially includes the ability to refuse sex. Since Indian Penal Code openly states that sexual intercourse by a husband with his wife who is 18 year old and above will not amount to rape, this includes the forceful sexual intercourse that happens without consent. So it paves way for marital rape. So this clause is called the marital rape exception clause. This is why we say IPC only partially criminalizes marital rape. Now this was the clause that was challenged in the court of law. That is the constitutionality of exception clause 2 was challenged. Separate petitions have been filed by NGOs, RIT Foundation and All India Democratic Women's Association and also by two individuals. To these petitions only a combined judgment has been declared. But we saw in the beginning it is a split verdict by two judges. The judges were Judge 1, Justice Raju Shakdeer and Judge 2, Justice C. Harishankar. Judge 1 held that exception of husband from marital rape is unconstitutional. He noted that the marital rape exception clause under which husbands have sexual intercourse with his wife of 18 years of age and above but without her consent is violative of Article 14, Article 15, Article 19, 1A and Article 21 of the Constitution. So, he struck down the marital rape exception clause. But the judge too had a differing opinion. He held that the marital rape exception clause does not violate constitution and the exception to husband is based on intelligible differentia. Okay? So, satisfying the test of intelligible differentia is required to qualify as a violation of Article 14. As you know, Article 14 embodies the general principle of equality before law and prohibits unreasonable discrimination between persons. This also means that all are equal in the eyes of law and the rule of law shall prevail. But this rule is not absolute and is subject to, to many exceptions. That is, the rule of law cannot prevent certain class of persons from being subjected to special laws. This provides power to the state to make laws which might operate differently on different classes of people, thereby ensuring the like classes are treated alike. This notion is known as doctrine of reasonable classification. The need for reasonable classification arises out of varying needs of different classes or different sections of people. So, reasonable classification is always based on real and substantial distinction. And hence, Article 14 permits reasonable classification. Now, you may have a question of how can one ensure that reasonable classification exists? For this, a twin test was made mandatory by the Supreme Court in the case of State of West Bengal West Anwarari Sarkar. So, for the reasonable classification to pass the test, two conditions must be fulfilled. First, classification must be founded on the intelligible differentia. Here, intelligible differentia means difference should reasonably distinguish between persons or things that are grouped together from those that are left out of the group. So, if two classes of persons are treated differently, it must be established that they are indeed distinguishable from each other. For example, an adult and child in case of marriage. Child marriage is punishable, whereas adult marriage is not. 
so the classification should be such a differentiation okay the second condition is such differentia must have a rational relation to the object sought to be achieved by the act that is there should be a rational nexus between the differentiation and the basic objective sought by the state under a law this condition basically implies that if an act or law is applying a differential treatment to two different groups then the act or law must have a rational link to the ultimate object that act aims to achieve without it the differentiation will be considered void now how this condition apply to our case in the case it was examined whether the differentia between married and unmarried women exist and whether such differentiation has a rational nexus with the objective of the rape law what is the objective of the rape law it is to protect from forced sexual intercourse or protecting a woman from being subjected to a sexual act against her will or against her consent according to judge one the rational nexus was not present because the objective of the rape law is to punish unconsented sexual act as it is harmful in nature so whether the woman is married or not and the perpetrator is husband or not still she has to go through the agony and pain hence marital rape is nothing but rape there is no relevance of marriage to rape this is according to judge 1 so there is no need for reasonable classification between married and unmarried women the marital rape exception clause also lacks rational nexus because such a differentiation of married and unmarried fails to punish the non consensual sexual acts which is the ultimate objective of the rape law so he struck down the marital rape exemption clause as unconstitutional but on the other hand the judge too held that differentiation of married and unmarried women is important to protect the institution of marriage so the intelligible differentia exist then the rational nexus of such differentiation exist because according to him mainly the marital rape exception clause is saving the marriage from any arbitrary and false accusation because it is practically impossible to establish the absence of consent within the peripheries of marital relations so the exception to husband should exist to save the scantity of marriage and thus he declared marital rape exception clauses constitutional these were the split verdicts we can agree that more than declaring marital rape exception clauses unconstitutional declaring it as constitutional has negative impacts see according to the author the assertions made by judge 2 has flaws in them now let us look at the flaws first how just striking down a clause that enables marital rape will threaten the institution of marriage is unclear there is no evidence of weakening or destruction of marriage due to criminalizing marital rape now moving on to the second flaw see it advocates that if rape is committed within the bounds of marriage then it is okay now moving on to the third flaw it shows no regard to love respect equality even care which are essential in a marriage or sexual relation the fourth flaw is it propounds the wrong conjugal exception of forced sex rather than a legitimate exception of sex with consent through this it also encourages the men to violate the sexual autonomy of married women because of these flaws supreme court according to the author of the editorial should take a look into it and provide a unified verdict that will ensure the protection of fundamental rights of all married women that's all regarding this discussion with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article have a look at this editorial article this editorial article talks about nato as you know russia invaded ukraine on february 24 apparently to stop nato's further expansion into its neighborhood but in less than 3 months the same invasion has pushed two more countries in the neighborhood to consider nato membership Yes last week the prime minister and president of Finland which has stayed neutral since the end of second world war said they hoped their country would apply for NATO membership without delay Sweden which has stayed out of military alliance for over 200 years stated that NATO membership would strengthen its national security and stability in the Baltic and Nordic regions 
if these two countries now formally apply for membership it would be the biggest strategic setback for russia whose most important foreign policy focus has been on weakening nato memberships so this is the crux of the editorial given here in this context as prelims is nearing let us quickly go through nato see the north atlantic treaty organization is a trans atlantic alliance of 30 like minded north american and european countries the alliance aimed to provide collective security against the soviet union it was created in 1949 the alliance promoted democratic values and diplomacy it enables members to consult and cooperate on defense and security related issues note that nato was the first peacetime military alliance the united states entered into outside of the western hemisphere after the destruction of the second world war the nations of europe struggled to rebuild their economies and ensure their safety the united states viewed an economically strong rearmed and integrated europe as vital to the prevention of communist expansion across the european continent this had led to the creation of nato okay soon after the creation of nato there was an outbreak of the korean war the north koreans attacked the south korea and at that time this was viewed as an example of communist aggression directed by moscow so the united states reinforced its troop commitments in europe later western germany also entered into nato see this led to the soviet union to create an organization to counter nato so the soviet union with its satellite states of eastern europe created the warsaw treaty organization which is simply called warsaw pact now coming back to nato see nato currently has 30 members here you can have a look at all the members of nato note that germany france poland are all members of nato see even turkey is a member of nato see the nato membership is open to any european state in a position to further the principle of this treaty and it should be ready to contribute to the security of north atlantic area the purpose of nato is to guarantee the freedom and security of its members through political and military means politically nato promotes democratic values and enables members to consult and cooperate on defense and security related issues it enables to solve problems and build trust and in the long run it helps to prevent conflict see nato is committed to the peaceful resolution of disputes if diplomatic efforts fail it has the military power to undertake crisis management operations note that all the decisions of the nato are taken by consensus okay so it is an expression of collective will of all the 30 members of nato that's all regarding this discussion with this let us move on to the next news article see this article this article says that the indian coast guard recovered a tsunami data boy of the national institute of ocean technology this is because the boy was drifted from its moored position 255 nautical miles east of chennai see it has drifted amid the deteriorating weather due to cyclone asani for your information the moored boys are equipped with sensors gps beacon lights and satellite trans receivers they collect and transmit oceanographic and meteorological data giving critical information on tsunami and cyclone hazards and this is the essence of the article given here In this context let us learn about tsunami in detail. We all know that tsunamis are giant waves caused by earthquakes or volcanic eruptions under the sea. This is because earthquakes and volcanic eruptions cause the sea floor to move abruptly resulting in sudden displacement of ocean water in the form of high vertical waves. They are also called as harbor waves or seismic sea waves. Normally the seismic waves cause only one instantaneous vertical wave but after the initial disturbance a series of after waves are created in the water that oscillate between high crest and low trough in order to restore the water level okay this is the basic about tsunami with this basic information let us see the effects of tsunami for that you should know a crucial fact here see the impact of tsunami is less over the ocean and more near the coast where they cause large scale devastations 
This is because the speed of the wave in the ocean depends upon the depth of the water. Waves travel faster in deeper water. Hence, amplitude of the wave in deeper water is low. But if the wave is in the shallower water, then it will travel slower. This results in amplitude of the wave being high in the shallow regions. So, a tsunami wave raises the ship only a meter or two and each rise and fall takes several minutes. So, a ship at sea is not much affected by tsunami and it is difficult to detect even tsunami in the deeper parts of the sea. As opposed to do this, when tsunami enters shallow water, its wavelength gets reduced and the period remains unchanged. This causes the wave height, that is the amplitude, to increase. Sometimes, the height of the tsunami can reach up to 15 meters and above. See, this is the reason for large-scale destruction along the shores. So, tsunami is also called as shallow water waves. See, tsunamis are frequently observed along the Pacific Ring of Fire, particularly along the coast of Alaska, Japan, Philippines. Okay? In the southern Indian Ocean, tsunamis are observed along the coast of Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, Sri Lanka and India. See, the Great Sumatra Earthquake was rated as the world's second largest recorded earthquake. This earthquake generated a devastating tsunami which caused unprecedented loss of life and damages to property in the Indian Ocean rim countries. The tsunami was considered as one of the deadliest natural hazards in the history of men. The tsunami that happened in 2004 killed over 2,30,000 people in 14 countries. So, this prompted Ministry of Earth Sciences to establish the Indian Tsunami Early Warning System. The Indian Tsunami Early Warning System was established in 2007 and it is based at and operated by the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, which is headquartered in Hyderabad. The Indian Tsunami Early Warning System comprises of a real-time network of seismic station, bottom pressure recorders, time gauges, and a 24-7 operational tsunami warning center. Now let us see the main objectives of Indian Tsunami Early Warning System. The first objective is to detect tsunami-genic earthquakes. The second objective is to monitor tsunamis and to provide timely advisories to vulnerable communities by means of latest communication methods with backend support of database and vision support systems. See, these are the objectives of Indian Tsunami Early Warning System. See, the Indian Tsunami Early Warning System is capable of issuing tsunami bulletins in less than 10 minutes after any major earthquake in the Indian Ocean. So, this provides us 20 or 30 minutes response time in case of Andamaran Nicobar region and few hours of response time in case of the mainland. Acting as one of the regional tsunami advisory service providers for the Indian Ocean region, Indian Tsunami Early Warning System also provides tsunami advisories to the Indian Ocean rim countries. That's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the basics of tsunami, the effects of tsunami and we also saw some points about Indian Tsunami Early Warning System. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. See this article here. This is a sports based article. Why I chose this article is that UPSC is turning highly unpredictable. Last year, UPSC even asked a question from cricket. If you guys can remember, they asked a question about World Test Championship. So, as far as UPSC is concerned, we must not take any news lightly. This is why in this discussion, we are going to see about the Thomas Cup. See, the news article says that Indian men's team won the Made in Thomas Cup title. According to the article, the victory sparked celebration back home with Prime Minister Narendra Modi leading the tributes. It also says that the sports minister Anurag Thakur announced a cash award of 1 crore for the victorious team. And also, Badminton Association of India President Himant Bishwa Sharma announced a reward of Rs 1 crore for the winning squad. Mr. Sharma also announced an award of Rs 20 lakhs for the support staff. See, this is the crux of the article. Now, let us see about the Thomas Cup. The Thomas Cup, sometimes called as the World Men's Team Championship, is an international badminton competition. It is conducted among the teams representing major nations of the Badminton World Federation. 
See, this Badminton World Federation is the sport's global governing body. The championship was started by the legendary badminton player of England, Sir George Allen Thomas, who was inspired by tennis's Davis Cup and football's World Cup. The first tournament was held from 1948 to 1949, and the tournament was conducted every three years till 1982. Since 1982 the Thomas Cup is being conducted every 2 years note that okay see the three teams with the most titles in the championship are Indonesia China and Malaysia with 14 10 and 5 titles respectively see team India had participated in 1952 for the first time in the Thomas Cup and after a wait of 70 years we have finally clinched the title this is so far the best performance of India in the competition See the last time the country was closest to the title was in the year 1979 when they made it to the semi-finals. But now India got its hands on the top prize in badminton as it registered a win against Indonesia with world championship medalist including Lakshya Sen, Kidambi Srikant and the world number 8 doubles duo of Chirag Shetty and Satwik Sairaj Ranki Reddy producing memorable performance. and know that Thomas Cup and Uber Cup are possibly the world's biggest and the most prestigious regularly held badminton events that's all regarding this news article with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article see this article here according to the article supreme court has said that remission or premature release of a convict has to be considered in terms of the policy applicable in the state where the crime was committed and not where the trial was transferred to and concluded supreme court said this while hearing a plea by a convict seeking direction to the state of gujarat to consider his application for premature release though the crime was committed in gujarat the top court in 2004 had transferred the case to mumbai due to the peculiar facts and circumstances of the case and at that instance itself the top court has said that after judgment of the conviction came to be passed all the further proceedings have to be considered in gujarat only which is where the crime was committed see this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us revise about the pardoning power of president in detail now article 72 of the indian constitution deals with the power of the president to grant pardons and to suspend reprieve remit or commute sentences in certain cases the article says that the president shall have the power to grant pardons reprieves respites or remissions of punishment or to suspend remit or commute the sentence of any person convicted of any offense so this is applicable in what cases see that also is given in the constitution itself the pardoning power of the president is applicable in all cases where the punishment or sentence is by a court martial in all cases where the punishment or sentence is for an offense against any law relating to a matter to which the executive power of the union extends and finally the pardoning power of the president is applicable in all cases where the sentence is a sentence of death Apart from this article 72 also says that it shall not affect the power conferred by law on any officer of the armed forces of the union to suspend remit or commute a sentence passed by a court martial so by law if any armed force officer is given power of suspending remitting or commuting a sentence passed by court martial then it will not be affected by this president's power of pardon suspend reprieve and commute of the sentence of court martial then the article also says that it shall not affect the power to suspend remit or commute a sentence of death exercisable by the governor of the state under any law for the time being in force so what does this mean this means that president's power to pardon suspend remit or commute a death sentence will not affect the governor's power to suspend remit or commute a death sentence see i have given the meanings of pardon respite remit reprieve and commute here please pause the video and go through it 
as prelims is rearing revise it because you can expect a question from the pardoning powers of president okay with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the practice prelims questions see there are four practice prelims questions today let us see them one by one let us take up the first question this question is about north atlantic treaty organization that is nato two statements are given we have to find the correct statements let us take up the first statement article 5 of nato agreement stipulates that any attack on nato members constitute an attack on all its members moving on to statement 2 NATO's 10th article delineates that the NATO alliance remains open to any European countries so long as it can abide by the rules of membership. See here both the statements are correct. Both the articles form the foundation of the NATO organization. Article 5 of NATO agreement stipulates that any attack on any NATO member constitutes an attack on all of its members. This highlights NATO's chief aim. that is to defend its member states and their citizen and nato's 10th article delineates that the alliance remains open to any european country as long as it can abide by the rules of the membership the decision of whether a nation is permitted to join is made by the north atlantic council so just reiterating the answer here the answer here is option c both 1 and 2 moving on to the next question See this question is about the pardoning power of the governor. Two statements about article 161 is given. We have to find the incorrect statement. Let us take up the first statement. Article 161 deals with the pardoning power of governor. See, we saw in the discussion that article 72 deals with the pardoning power of president, right? And here article 161 deals with the pardoning power of governor. So statement 1 is correct. Moving on to the second statement. Like president, governor also has the power to reprieve, remit, commute and suspend the sentence of court martial, but governor has no powers with respect to a death sentence. See, this statement is completely wrong. Article 161 says that the governor of a state shall have the power to grant pardons, reprieve, respite or remission of punishment or to suspend, remit or commute the sentence of any person. convicted of any offense against any law relating to a matter to which executive power of the state extends so the first part of the statement is wrong governor does not have the power when it comes to the sentence of court martial not even commute reprieve or suspension or respite now coming to the second part of the statement see governor does not have any power to pardon a death sentence as a part of article 161 because it is not mentioned in it but do you remember what we saw in the discussion according to article 72 the pardoning power of the president does not affect the governor's power to suspend remit or commute a sentence of death so from this it is clear that governor cannot pardon a death sentence but he can suspend remit or commute a death sentence so the governor has no power when it comes to court martial but he has some power when it comes to death sentence given by high court of a particular state governor cannot pardon it he can only suspend remit or commute so second statement here is completely wrong since in the question they are asking us to find the incorrect statements the correct answer here is option b two only now moving on to the third question This is also a two statement question two statements in relation to tsunami is given we have to find the correct statement let us take up the first statement the height and the wavelength of tsunami waves is high near the shores which is the reason for the devastating effect see this statement is wrong this is because height will be high near the shores but the wavelength of the tsunami will decrease once tsunami reaches the shore tsunami wavelength will be more in the deeper parts of the ocean as it approaches the coast the wavelength will decrease note this okay now let us take up the second statement tsunami is the japanese word meaning harbor waves see this is a easy statement and we all know this is a correct statement the word tsunami is composed of japanese word su which means harbor and nami which means wave so the correct answer here is option b two only see this is a practice question for you i have given three individuals and the related sports you have to find the correct pairs okay so just go through the question and post the answer for this question in the comment section 
The mains question based on today's discussion is displayed here. Interested aspirants, write the answers and post it in the comment section. If you like today's video, like, comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.